Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to our webinar today, uh, The Mist of Hospice, and we thank all of you for being here. As a reminder, these complimentary monthly webinars are brought to you through a collaboration with O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices Hospice and Palliative Services, and Alzheimer's Orange County. And I am Kim Bailey of Alzheimer's Orange County. And we're pleased to provide this monthly webinar as a service to the community, primarily for senior care providers and workers in the field. And we try to present topics of great interest to anyone working with uh, seniors and folks with dementia. And of course, today, we're so pleased to have one of our partners, two of our partners with us to present on this very uh, important topic. And before I tell you a little bit more about, actually we have two speakers today, let's go over the what's necessary for you to obtain continuing ed education credit for this webinar. So now I want to tell you a little bit about our speakers. Again, they are from Care, Cho uh, Care Choices Hospice and Palliative Services, Reverend Chip Fisher, has served as hospice and palliative care uh, chaplain there for over two years. He has offered spiritual and emotional support professionally to those suffering from terminal uh, illnesses, other diseases for over 20 years and has served as an effective a teacher and um, as an effective teacher and spiritual director over those 20 years. While grounded and growing in his own spiritual tradition, Reverend Chuck affirms and embodies the role of the chaplain to accompany uh, patients and their loved ones in their unique uh, journeys and in their own faith traditions, or none. Uh, this may involve uh, eliciting from them and encouraging them in their own sources of comfort or empowering them to find ways to continue to co-create their own best possible stories in the time they have left. Uh, he can also be a catalyst in facilitating difficult ethical conversations uh, that families sometimes face when a loved one is on hospice care. Uh, Chip comes to us with excellent background and training with degrees from Stanford, as well as the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley and he has a certificate for successful completion of a year-long residency in spiritual care from top 10 U.S. teaching hospital, UCSF. And then we also have, uh, we're fortunate to have Judy Bate, and she is the Director of Quality Management for Care Choices. With over 15 years experience in the field of hospice care, Ms. Pate facilitates clinical education and training for all staff, uh, the onboarding process, compliance, infection control, safety, HIPAA, and performance improvement for the company. She is devoted to excellence in nursing and is a passionate advocate for improved patient outcomes. She achieved earlier success in information technology as a programmer and analyst until she discovered her true calling to a nursing career while volunteering for hospice. She's an experienced and seasoned uh, bedside nurse, educator, trainer, and quality improvement specialist. So we truly have uh, two experts to walk us through this, uh, this presentation and to clarify some of the myths of hospice. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much for those kind introductions. And I would like to welcome everybody to this webinar. We're so thankful and so excited that you could join us. And Chip and I would both like to thank our sponsors immensely for giving us this opportunity to talk about hospice. It's a, obviously a very passionate subject for both of us. It's a true calling. And there's so much to talk about with hospice. We're going to cover as much as we can today. And we hope you get a a basic understanding of hospice and some of the myths that are currently involved. I'm trying, I'm going to try not to read the slides except for the goals. 
So the goals for hospice, if you could go back to the goals, please, the goal slide. We're going to discuss the basic concepts of hospice care. And we're going to tell you about the actual benefits of the palliative interventions that you commonly see in hospice care. And then we'll discuss the most common myths and misconceptions surrounding hospice care, including clinical, spiritual, and emotional. Next slide. So we truly believe that hospice care enhances the quality of life at end of life. Next slide, please. So what is hospice? And you can start clicking through. Hospice really is an aspect of healthcare. It's available to those who have a terminal illness, which is defined by having a prognosis of six months or less, should the disease follow its natural progression, which would be certified by two physicians, and the patient and or representative would elect hospice care over curative care. This is something that is gonna provide basically comfort, relieves distressing symptoms, and offers a great deal of support for those patients and their loved ones and caregivers who are caring for those people. Hospice is holistic. So that means we don't just consider the clinical aspects, we don't just consider the symptoms, we think of the whole person. And the whole person is not just physical, but there's an emotional aspect, there's a psychosocial and a social aspect with different cultural uh, items going on for each person, and of course spiritual and or religious uh, issues that that patient may be experiencing. Could you click? The big difference in hospice care and the most important thing that you need to understand is that in hospice, we are focusing on caring, not curing. So the decision has been made, no more aggressive treatment. We're going to focus on caring for that person at the bedside. Next slide, please. So what is, next slide, please, sorry. Uh, one of the myths about hospice is that it's only for people with cancer. So if you could just click one time, please. We do know that hospice is for anyone with that life-limiting illness. And I already talked a little bit about how you have to be eligible for hospice. Each disease has its own set of criteria that we have to meet in order to have the person become eligible for hospice. But this could be for anybody of any age and any type of progressive disease, as long as the person wants comfort and not a cure. So if you could click again. So some of the examples, and this is certainly not limited to this, but end-stage renal, click. End-stage COPD, click. End-stage heart disease, and end-stage liver disease. And of course, there's a multitude of other diseases like end-stage stroke, Alzheimer's. Thank you. You can go back, you can go to the next one, thank you. Another myth that I've heard very often is that people think, oh, a hospice is a place, I'm gonna go to the hospice. If you could just click one time, please. That is a misconception. Um, it's not necessarily a place where you go, although there are many inpatient hospices across the country where someone can go to, it would be similar to a nursing home setting where hospice is provided 24 hours a day. However, and the nursing home was the original uh, place where hospice was discovered in the 1960s. A lot of changes since then, if people aren't aware, but hospice can be provided anywhere. So we go to wherever the patient resides. Now that could be in an assisted living facility, it could be in a skilled nursing facility, in a home, or in a board and care. And I see we've gone to, uh, people can actually be homeless and still get hospice care. It does become challenging, but we go to where the patient resides. So the components of hospice, just the basics, that there's just a lot to go over, but there is a hospice team that will come and visit the patient and the family, and that's composed of uh, an RN, a registered nurse, a social worker, a chaplain, a hospice aide, a physician, of course, and there's other um, hospice aide, um, there's other uh, PT, OT, ST as required. We also provide durable medical equipment. You also hear this referred to as home medical equipment and supplies. So we, we supply hospital beds, wheelchairs, walkers, uh, Hoyer lifts, 
uh, specialty mattresses, whatever that patient needs, in addition to supplies to take care of the patient at the bedside. And of course, medications, which is a huge advantage. So this would be medications that are related to the terminal diagnosis, but also any medications that are related to symptom control that will relieve suffering and help that patient with their symptoms. Another thing that I've heard generally in hospice over the years as my experience as an RN case manager, a lot of people think that when they go on hospice that the doctor and the nurse are going to make all of the decisions for their care. So they kind of give up and surrender and say, okay, you're going to take over for me and you're going to tell me what I need to do. And of course, we know that this is based on everybody's experience with acute care because in a hospital setting, that traditionally is the way that it goes. There are specific protocols in acute care where based on the disease, this is what we do, these are the tests we run, these are the medications we give. Hospice, not true. Because we look and we define what the patient and the family want as their goals in hospice. So we do exactly what they want. So it, it would not be unusual for someone to say, you know what, I don't want to take any of these medications. I don't want that treatment. And that would be perfectly okay with us. Now, of course, there would be times when we might say, you know, we understand that you don't want to take that heart medication, but I just want to let you know that it could help you in being more comfortable. So we're always going to advocate for you. We're not going to force you to do things you don't want, but we understand how the medications can help you. So if we think it will help, we'll use our recommendations. But I have to tell you, there are exceptions to refusing care. And one of those things is, and these are one of the, the requirements we have to meet, you have to allow us to do a head-to-toe assessment with a registered nurse at least every 15 days. Now that means head-to-toe complete body check. And there's a reason for that because, you know, even though people may not be comfortable, and of course we always take that into consideration, sometimes uh, people that are bedridden would develop, you know, pressure sores or skin breakdown, and we have to be able to see that. So you can't refuse that head-to-toe assessment at least every 15 days. Now, I don't want to say that that's all you're going to get is every 15 days. You're going to get more visits than that, but every 15 days at a minimum. Next slide, please. A lot of people think that hospice is expensive, and they think this because they know there's a team of people coming to your home providing care. There's a doctor, possibly, there's a nurse, there's a social worker, there's a chaplain, there's hospice aid giving you a bed, bath, or a shower. Hospice care is not costly to the patient, the family, and the caregiver. Let me tell you about some of the multiple sources of payment. The first one, if you could click, please, is Medicare. Medicare is the biggest payer of hospice in this country. It's at least 80% covered by the Medicare benefit. Next. In California, of course, we have Medi-Cal. So there is a hospice benefit available to those that are using Medi-Cal. And in addition to that, most private insurance plans, if you have private insurance, including HMOs, they have a hospice benefit. So it's become, it's very well known among insurers that hospice is a good thing. Next. Some people are able to pay privately and want to pay privately and will do so. Next. In addition to that, it's really important for you to understand that most hospices, I'm not sure about all of them, but most of them have something called a charitable foundation where we actually get um, donations from patients, families, and caregivers after their patients have been taken care of. And we can use that money to finance hospice care for those that are not able to. So we don't turn people away because of the um, inability to pay. Next. This is one that has become very interesting. And I really want uh, to get this point across. When I talked about the nurse visit every 15 days, you will have the hospice patient and family and caregiver will have a registered nurse assigned as the case manager. That case manager will determine the frequency of visits based on the acuity of the patient, how severe their disease is, what kind of care they need. They usually go more often than every 15 days. 
However, there are going to be times, possibly, when the patient has a crisis. They have shortness of breath, maybe, or unmanageable pain, or nausea, vomiting, and they need somebody to be at that bedside more often to help give medications, provide treatment, provide a little bit of training to the family to help with that crisis. This level of care is called continuous care, but it's very strictly regulated. We have to make sure that there indeed is a crisis. So once the crisis is over, we have to discontinue it. But when the crisis is going on, the nurse has to be at the bedside. So it has to be skilled care. This could be an LVN or an RN for a minimum of eight hours up to 24 hours a day. So we have to um, provide at least eight hours a day. But once it's over, if everything's fine, you have to understand that you have to go back to the regular level of care because this is our requirement for billing. Some more common myths, if you could click one time. Some people think that you have to be a do not resuscitate in order to be on hospice. It's really not true. People can come on hospice and still think, decide that they do want to be resuscitated should something happen. It's perfectly okay. You may decide after care has gone on for a while that you want to change that, but it will not stop you from going on hospice. You do not have to have an advanced directive either. Of course, we always recommend in healthcare having an advanced directive. And so your team will talk to you about that. Your social worker will talk to you about that, the importance of how we can help you with that in defining your care. Hospice is, as I talked before, um, if you remember, it's a benefit that ex is extended for a period of six months or less. So some people think, well, does that mean that at the end of six months, I'm going to have to go off of hospice and be discharged? No, it doesn't. We evaluate you, and after six months, if you still qualify for hospice, we will extend the hospice care. So that is not something that's going to end and automatically. Next click, please. Good. Thank you. Another thing that people think is I'm stuck. Once I go on hospice, that's it. I can never have acute care again. It's over. As long as you have elected the hospice benefit and we are seeing you as a team, of course, you're going to get hospice. But let's say that the family or the patient gets scared and they decide, no, I don't want to do this. I, I just want to give it one last try. I want to go back to the hospital. I want to have acute care. Or I just don't want to do this anymore. Of course, you can, you can do what we call revoking hospice. You can sign a paper that says, I no longer want hospice. You can go to the hospital. You can have whatever care you want. If you decide in the future that you want to go back on hospice, of course, you can go back on hospice again and there's no limit to how often you can do this. So nobody is stuck with the care that they're electing. Next, please. This is interesting because I think this, is, uh, this myth has been around for a long, long time. A lot of people think when you go on hospice, that's it. Hospice is there, they're going to give morphine and they're going to bring on the death of the patient. It is, has absolutely nothing to do with that. If you could just click one time. Hospice does not bring on death, nor does it prolong death. We walk alongside the patient on their journey. We want it to be as natural as possible. So we take care of your symptoms. We hold your hand. We provide comfort and education to you, to your family members, to facility owners, to caregivers to help along that journey and be there with you every step of the way. But our goal is comfort, not death. Next click, please. So obviously, that dying process is going to be as natural as possible. You could click one more time. We have very specialized knowledge in hospice. All of our team members are very well educated and very caring people that will provide that knowledge to you and your loved ones at the end of life. Judy, um, I just want to mention that this is an opportunity for all of us online to educate families that we work with because I know that we get a lot of families that think that there's going to be 
uh, 24-hour caregiving provided, like custodial caregiving. And so I think it's really important for all of us to set realistic expectations of our families, correct? Yeah. yeah. Too, because yeah. you're right. Some people do think that uh, I've heard, it has come up from time to time in all my experiences as a hospice nurse, Sometimes people think, well, just because you're on hospice, you should have somebody. We have, we need somebody at the bedside. Uh, do you provide 24-hour caregivers? And we don't. Right. We do with resources, but no, hospice can't be custodial care because then we're getting into regulatory issues that we have to, you know, work with. And so we will help you if you need some additional care, but we don't provide. 24 hour uh, at the bedside care. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Thank you, Judy. There's so much about hospice that we could talk about. I'm telling you, we could go on forever. <laughs> but um, as we're talking about, um, you know, I talked about how we don't hasten death. And I talked about how a lot of people think still to this day that hospice goes in with morphine and, um, you know, over, you know, over sedates somebody or over medicates people. There's a lot of myths about morphine, and I do want to talk about that. Um, I don't really have a lot of time. You could probably do a whole webinar on uh, opioids, because as you all know, uh, the opioid crisis in this country has hit an all-time high, and there's a lot of uh, new regulations that are going to be taking place related to opioids. It's kind of different for hospice patients, I have to tell you, because we are not concerned about our hospice patients becoming addicted to drugs. Hospice patients, a lot of times, opioid is the best way to treat somebody's pain. It's not always the only way, but a lot of times it's the best way. There's uh, Morphine happens to be the gold standard for pain management for many, many reasons, because it can be titrated um, up, it can uh, have minimal side effects after a period of acclimation. So what I mean by that is um, people sometimes take about a day or so to get used to the effects of morphine if they start taking it. But then they acclimate to it and those side effects that make them feel somewhat dizzy or sedated go away. But morphine is a very good drug. Sedation isn't always going to happen. And I want to explain one important issue that I want you to understand. You can take this with you about morphine and opioids in general, is that when you're starting on an opioid, you always start low and go slow. So you don't automatically hit someone with a, a really high dose of an opioid because of course they're going to get sedated and you're not going to be able to talk to them. They're going to be sleepy, they might feel dizzy. Always start low, especially for some of the older patients who are very frail. They may be what we call opioid naive. They've never taken an opioid before, so we want to go slow with that. And we understand that in hospice. Our goal is to keep you comfortable, not zonked out. Some people think that some pain cannot be managed. In hospice, we absolutely know that this is not true. I want to let you know there are many types of pain that could respond to different types of pain medication. And again, we could do a whole in-service on pain medication, but without going into detail, I can tell you that we have a whole array of treatment options that we can implement to help with different types of pain. So, for instance, bone pain might be treated with something similar to ibuprofen. You might add in a little bit of morphine, but it's not the primary medication that will help with that. What we do know is that most patients on hospice near the end of life, regardless of their terminal diagnosis, do experience pain. And studies have shown that approximately 85% of people will develop pain if they haven't developed it yet when they come on hospice. So we need to take care of that pain. The last point on there is when you see somebody sleeping, some people think, well, they're asleep, so obviously they're not in pain. And if you could just change the slide, I want to expound on that a little bit. Oh, go back, please. One more. Thank you. Um, the same thing goes for somebody watching television or somebody that's visiting with people or maybe they're laughing or joking around and someone that doesn't understand pain management or the disease process might think, oh, they couldn't possibly be having pain because look at them, they're sleeping. 
They're watching TV, they're visiting, they're laughing. Nothing could be further from the truth. What we do know, and if any of you have ever experienced something called chronic pain, you know that you get used to it. Your body gets used to being in a state of pain. So those symptoms that most of us would show when we're having bad pain will not be outwardly visible. So people learn to hide their pain. We in hospice have been trained to look for that. And along those lines, people sometimes think that someone with dementia does not have the same pain stimulation. Again, nothing could be further from the truth. Just because someone has dementia does, or Alzheimer's does not mean that they're not having pain. We have been trained in hospice to use nonverbal uh, pain scales. So, of course, we can't ask these people, what's your, what's your pain score on a scale of 0 to 10? We have to look for nonverbal signs of pain, like People might grimace or cry or pull away from you or tense up. So we can gather a good pain assessment based on nonverbal signs of pain. We have to treat pain. And again, the same thing goes with your vital signs. For those of us that don't very often experience pain, when you have pain, typically your blood pressure will go up, your heart will speed up, and you'll start to breathe faster. If somebody has been experiencing pain for a long time, maybe untreated or undertreated, those vital signs could look completely normal, so we can't always base it on that. And the last point is something I really find important. You can't necessarily manage pain very well or at all with by giving the medication as needed. So you just don't wait until the pain hits somebody to give the pain medication. One of the basic concepts of managing pain is to give pain medication around the clock so that the blood levels stay fairly consistent of the pain medication. So it would be given either once a day or twice a day. And then, of course, you would add in some as-needed medication for what we call breakthrough pain. So that's important to understand. Next slide, please. So what happens when we don't treat pain or we under-treat pain? If you can just click one time for me, please. I talked about this a little bit in the previous slide where I talked about the vital signs. So those of you that are uh, healthcare professionals or nurses understand that whenever there's a deficit or a problem in the body, there's an organ that always tries to make up for that deficit. And that organ is our heart. Your heart starts to beat faster. It thinks if it can beat faster to send the blood out to the body that somehow it's going to help. So if you could click one time, please. That puts a lot of stress on your cardiovascular system, which we really don't want to do. So by not treating pain or under-treating pain, we are potentially uh, causing problems in our cardiovascular system. Uh, pain itself, as you know, anybody that's going uh, through any problems, um, you can see that um, it could interrupt your sleep. And if your sleep is interrupted, of course, you're not going to feel very good the next day. Next click, please. And then you're going to lose interest in eating, drinking, even socializing with other people because, you know, that's your quality of life. If you're having pain and not sleeping, those quality of life issues are going to be going out the window. So we don't want that to happen. And then pain can lead to confusion. You could get confused. You could stand up and fall, which could lead to injury, which, of course, we don't want to happen. And finally, one more click. That could cause you to just be overall dissatisfied with us. If we're not managing your pain or your loved one's pain, you're not going to be very happy with the care that we're providing. So that is the most important aspect. And I think now what I'd like to do, um, I hope I gave you some good information. I want to turn it over to my associate, Chip, and he's going to give you some good information about religious beliefs and opioids at the end of life. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, Judy. Very concise. I learn. I, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and I so appreciate each one of you starting your professional day an hour earlier to become more knowledgeable as to how to serve perhaps your patients, your clients, and to hear what it is that we have to say. So to begin with, I will continue with what Judy has begun with respect to some religious traditions and theological insights as to 
helping ameliorate pain and suffering, but then the heart of what I'd like to talk about have to do with myths and myth, myths, myths and misunderstandings that I hear all the time, um, misconceptions that I feel are very important for us to be able to be clear about. As far as I'm aware, to transition back to the religious views towards cessation of suffering, every major religious tradition is interested in alleviating suffering. We think of the Buddhists and compassion for all living things. Judaism, of course, compassion, care for widows and orphans and aliens. Uh, the Christian tradition, um, Jesus was all about alleviating suffering, sometimes through supernatural means and healing. If any of you are interested in a more scholarly approach, I found helpful an article that I accessed through BBC 2014 entitled End of Life Care, What Do Religions Say? So this is a citation, a round table discussion from ethical recognized leaders of respective religions. The author is Flavio Di Consiglio, C-O-N-S-I-G-L-I-O. So I won't elaborate further, but that's a helpful source if you're interested in learning more. There's some nuance in particular religions that may see value in suffering. I happen to have been brought up Roman Catholic and I heard more than once offer it up. And that is that in uh, their understandings in Catholicism and I understand in Islam that sometimes suffering can be put to uh, good use, can be redemptive. So it's not that every religious tradition unilaterally just says no suffering, but uh, generally speaking, no religion I'm aware of wants to see pain or suffering go on unmanaged. With respect to chaplains can help with misunderstandings, perhaps next slide. Chaplains, well, excuse me, not we're not quite ready for that one, but uh, sub point nonetheless. Chaplains can help our clients, our patients by clarifying. One of the first things I will do if I'm in the presence of a patient, let's say whose theological tradition is not my own, is simply to, may I call an imam? May I call a rabbi for you? Often I can be helpful by asking a patient a further question. I never want to impose my beliefs, but I want to be respectful. So for example, if someone will say, you know, I'm, I must deserve this, I'm going to die, I'm on hospice, or why is God angry with me? What did I do to, to deserve this? I'm not going to correct them, but I may ask, would you mind telling me, how do you believe God is looking at you? Or if in your tradition you understand God as a loving presence or even parent, how would you feel if this were your child? Would you be interested in punishing him or her? So sometimes a reframing can help people to clarify even within their own religious tradition. I have a sub point here. Chaplains can help sometimes with misunderstandings. Again, I'm not a medical expert, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was called in one loved one of a patient of ours was very upset, very uh, <laughs> hopping mad actually. My mom has been with you for 24 hours now and she's still not getting the pain relief she needs. Needs. What are you doing? And it happened fortunately that our uh, nurse was right there in the adult living facility. I asked the nurse that that is a misunderstanding. Fortunately, I just spoke with the loved one, the caregiver. This is not unmitigated unmediated pain. This is terminal agitation. He told me in that case the medical differences. So in that, just to be able to explain a misunderstanding sometimes can help a great deal. But now I would like to get to the uh, spiritual and emotional myths of hospice I see on the slide. First one, however it's stated, which I feel very strongly about, is somehow uh, families will say, well, we're just giving up. We are not ready for hospice. We do not want to give up on grandma or grandfather. And this giving up is, uh, is to me, absolutely uh, mistaken for a couple different reasons. Uh, in our company, 
care choice is as a chaplain, I have the privilege of making condolence calls. So that is, I call folks when, when we lose them. And I hear so often, very often, most commonly, your hospice care was wonderful. I only wish we had gotten started sooner. You provided such comfort to my loved one. Thank you. And so it saddens me when I sometimes hear families say, we don't want to do this. We're not, we don't want to give up on grandma or, or whoever the loved one might be. I would also try to clarify when I have opportunity, depending on the faith tradition of the family or the patient, him or herself, but it might be that I can, again, reframe their question. We're, when you bring someone into hospice care, we are simply trying to understand how nature is taking its course. Or if I understand someone to be religious, let's say Christian, I know you believe God is in charge. Under no circumstances are we the hospice providers reducing God's opportunity to heal your husband, let's say, we are simply listening to what's happening. We are paying attention to the body and spirit of your loved one. Sometimes, of course, when we're called in as hospice providers, the options left are not very good, but we're always interested in providing and finding that best option. And I would, here I too, I would like to cite uh, studies. I'm not a medical person being a chaplain, and so I do not, normally cite these to my patients, but believe me, I'm always aware of these statistics, these studies, and they help me to be very confident when I offer spiritual care. People do not call in a hospice because they're giving up on their on their loved ones. So I would cite from Atul Gawande, a fabulous book, if you're not aware of it, Being Mortal, a comprehensive look at our American, very strong medical system, but uh, this MD, this professor at the Harvard School of Medicine, MacArthur Genius Fellowship recipient, looks at some of the gaps and systematic blind spots when our American healthcare system comes to looking at people towards the end of their life. So I would quote page 178 from Being Mortal. Quote, in one study, researchers followed 4,493 Medicare patients with terminal cancer or end-stage congestive heart failure. For patients with breast cancer, prostate cancer, or colon cancer, the researchers found no difference in survival time between those who went into hospice and those who didn't. And curiously, for some conditions, hospice care seemed to extend survival. Those with pancreatic cancer gained an average of three weeks. Those with lung cancer gained six weeks. Those with congestive heart failure gained three months. So what he's concluding is that in some cases, patients who are ill and in, uh, in hospice appropriate will live longer. Now, Clearly, no one submits uh, to hospice care in order to extend their life necessarily, but it does happen. A second study you'll find on page 177, the last citation, is also from Being Mortal, a uh, study from the Massachusetts General Hospital, 151 patients with stage four lung cancer. Half were assigned to the usual oncology care, half to the usual oncological care, along with the palliative care specialist and the results, those with palliative care stopped chemotherapy earlier. They entered hospice far earlier. They experienced less suffering at the end of their lives and they live 25% longer. And he puts that in italics. So it's important for me to recognize that by no means are we giving up on someone when he or she comes into hospice. And it is very common, certainly in our hospice company, for people to be graduated out of hospice. Uh, we call it discharge due to medical prognosis, but uh, sometimes folks do get better and they're not hospice appropriate anymore. Uh, moving to a second theme, a second misunderstanding, I hear sometimes if we don't use the word hospice around the patient, 
we want to avoid negativity. That is, if we don't mention hospice, uh, somehow we won't be perceived negative, so we're just going to not mention it. Well, certainly I'm aware of and I want to be sensitive to a family's concerns, and more than once I've introduced myself for this reason as a healthcare worker, but in my experience, let's say someone's 85 years old, they have been down many, many medical, uh, how to say, rabbit holes. Most 85, 90 year olds know that they're not going to live forever. It's very seldom the patient, but often we find it's the adult child or children. It's they who cannot bear to think about losing their mom, for example and often tensions will arise that were already existing within those adult siblings. If, for instance, one might say, we are not giving up on mom, we love her, she was a fighter. Someone else will be saying, listen, the doctors have been saying she's coming to the end of the line. Chaplains can be helpful in allowing families to have constructive, enlightened conversations. I was at a adult living facility less than a month ago, went in and a husband, about 50 years old, was so angry, he was upset. Um, he had caused all sorts of commotion. I went in and listened for about 20 minutes. He just said, we're not giving up. We've been through everything in 25 years. My wife is a fighter. We can do this. He didn't want to hear anything negative. I didn't see anything negative, but you know what? In about 20 minutes, he talked himself out. The storm subsided, and he looked at me, and he just said, I am not ready to let go of her. I don't know what I would do. That's the reality of the matter. It's not whether we talk about hospice or not. I remember a communication breakdown in the hospital, another instance of people afraid to use the words and it, and it, har and it harms the opportunity they might have for a really beautiful time together. 16 year old woman, uh, teenager in the hospital who who was terminal, she kept saying, I don't want my mom to worry about me. I'm not going to mention this. She knew she was dying. The mom separately would tell me, I don't want to appear negative. I want to stay strong for my daughter. But both of them, in other words, understood exactly what was happening. But because of the misunderstanding, they could not, until a chaplain was able to be a good mediator, they were not enjoying the closeness and the connection that could and did come when they both recognized Oh, my word, of course we're both recognizing what's real. We can enjoy a great bonding. And I think that was a gift to the mom. Uh, once she lost her daughter, at least they had several weeks of, of real closeness as a result of that. And finally, I would suggest even this concept of negativity, that somehow hospice is negative, we can't mention it, that's a value judgment. Often that is not... Uh, that's not true at all. I hear that again. I hear that from our patients here so often. My mom had a beautiful death or dad is out of pain now. His suffering is behind him. This was, we are so glad for the way it worked out. So what people fear as a negative can be such a beautiful positive. And again, religious traditions underscore that as well, whether uh, views of heaven or paradise or moksha or release from the wheel of suffering. Many different traditions support this idea. This is not a negative. Finally, I'd like to address briefly the idea that uh, hospice teams serve only the patient and that chaplains are Christians. Christian chaplains will benefit Christians. Chaplains maybe bring our own agenda. So three, um, three themes with which I'd like to wrap up. Well, of course, I and we hospice providers serve the patient, but I see my role as communicating with the family unit, including the patient. Uh, there are many, of course, dynamics. Is the patient competent to speak for herself? Is the family um, getting along together? We just, uh, in our company, received a very valuable didactic from Dr. William Hoy, who's a, a, a doctorate, teaches at Baylor Medical School, a medical ethicist, talked about so often how we Westerners, we North Americans, take for granted that the patient is the final ultimate decision maker. And he mentioned different cultures representing billions of people around the globe would never think of having the patient make the decision alone. 
It might, it might mean the entire family unit. It might mean a spiritual leader. It might mean lots of different parties are involved in any one decision. So we always want to be culturally sensitive and aware of, the, of how it is that we want to be able to serve the family unit and the patient. We want to be good at avoiding what the psychologists call, we do not want to ever become triangulated. That is one, let's say one sibling will say, this is the way it is. Uh, this is what our family and my mom really wants. And the other sibling will try to call someone aside and say, oh no, my mom wanted that. Don't listen to my brother. Uh, so in that case, a chaplain can be useful in saying, well, let's all, um, let's see if we can all get together and let's be clear what it is and why we believe mom said what she did. We recognize we're not gonna fix a family system that's been dysfunctional for decades, but we can be helpful. The understanding that chaplains are Christians and will benefit Christians. In my uh, residency at UCSF, yes, several Christians, Catholics, there was a Roman Catholic priest, there was a Buddhist practitioner, there was a Muslim, there was a Universalist Unitarian, so we are all trained, we chaplains, with a minimum of 400 units, 400 hours of observed professional training by our certifying board, the ACPD. We are taught in our highest ethics, we are never to try to convert anyone. We are never to try to impose our view on someone. Our responsibility is to accompany uh, where appropriate uh, to provide encouragement and support. So I want to be first off a listener. I want to understand I can always learn and be taught by the families I have the privilege of visiting. Often, let's say I'm with a, I happen not to be Muslim, uh, but if I'm with a Muslim household, may I call your imam? May I call someone from your faith community? How may I be helpful? I don't have to know anything, and I don't think any of our listeners, any of you, are expected to know everything, but to be respectful and to recognize we have the opportunity to provide support in the direction, in the tradition of our patient. That's as well as any of us can do. Finally, this idea that chaplains bring our own agenda uh, and impose that I've mentioned ethically, theologically, our, our first role is to support. Uh, I will never forget in, let's say, my first month of training at the hospital, my, when I talked about, well, I was there to bring hope. I was there to encourage and brighten someone's day. She looked me in the eye and said, what right do you have to bring hope? That's not your job. I said, what? And she was saying, what if the patient doesn't want to feel hopeful? So we are respectful, even with things that would appear commonsensical, not to impose, but to accompany. So I suspect our time is getting very short. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Judy, for uh, such a concise, professional uh, starting us off. And thanks to all of you. I hope that we've been helpful as you are confronted now with opportunities to perhaps talk to people, to be clear yourselves as to what hospice really does provide and what we are not about and what some of those myths are. Thanks so much. Um, Chip, if, uh, I'm going to ask you and Judy to stay on the line because we do have a number of questions from our audience, uh, including one just asking if you have citations for some of those references you made. I think you might have a slide the last slide that has those. Hmm. Uh, there are there are references in the last slide, but we will check over those and make sure that we've got everything. Okay. And if there's something, we will make sure that we put those. Great, together. great. Okay, so I'm going to go forward at this time with some of the questions that our audience has asked. And uh, as the clock keeps ticking, those of you who need to leave after you've been on for 60 minutes, are of course welcome to leave, but we'd love for you to remain online uh, because we've got some pretty thoughtful questions here. So one uh, one attendee would like to know, and this is for either of you: can can you be on hospice for one disease and still be treated with your doctor for another disease? Good question. That's a really good question. Um, the idea is. Uh, when you elect hospice care, you are saying, I no 
longer want acute care. So it really depends on what the other disease is. So I'm sorry to be a little bit obtuse about that, but generally, I don't want to say it's black and white, but it generally is either hospice or acute care. But there are there are caveats to that. It depends on what the other disease is. You know, if it's somehow related to the terminal diagnosis, then that would be a different situation. And I know that you look at each, each case on an individual basis and basis, need, yeah. so I, I understand why you would need a little more information on that um, so what else do we have here who trains the custodians quote unquote custodians at home to be able to do the day-to-day -day care you know be, in other words family caregivers that are transferring and feeding and you know they're dealing with wheelchairs and commodes, yes. um, and and who trains them to be custodial caregivers? That's a really I, this, good question. Yeah. And the job of the hospice team to provide that training, because of course, when you have somebody that you're taking care of at home, even though you've got a hospice team coming in, maybe two or three times a week you're still left with the rest of the time. You don't know how to do all these things. You've never taken care of somebody that's bed bound. It's our job to provide that education to the families and to any additional caregivers that might be there. So that's our job to provide that uh, education because it's a scary thing when you don't know what to do. We do that. Okay, wonderful. Um, the next one is my family member with Lewy body dementia suffered from severe unrelenting anxiety. The hospice team met privately with me and recommended terminal sedation. It was a difficult conversation due to my religious beliefs and I chose not to elect that option. Does that, uh, does terminal sedation continue to be associated with hospice care? Oh boy, these are really thought provoking questions. Oh, by the way, this, this was back in like 2006 and 2007. And you no, know, it is still something that comes up from time to time, even with us. And when somebody does bring up that particular uh, issue of terminal sedation, we have an ethics committee that meets and the family member is, or the caregiver is invited to be part of that discussion, which includes the doctor, the team, the administrators. We talk about all the issues involved. So ultimately, of course, it is the decision of those people that are involved in care. Um, it is something that we can consider, but it's always considered very thoughtfully. It is a, it's a huge decision to make on every level, as I'm sure Chip will attest to, you know, not just clinically, but there's this whole emotional and spiritual aspect involved uh, that people are struggling with. But we've had a few instances where people have wanted to talk about that so it's not out of the question to discuss it. Judy, can you define it, terminal sedation? Terminal sedation, so there's a difference between terminal sedation and the end of life option in California, which you know is a whole another law that was written into effect in California. So terminal sedation is just going to uh, allow the patient to get a higher level of some type of sedative drug, which actually allows them to fall into more of a restful uh, state so that they can uh, pass away peacefully. So that example that that person gave, if somebody is dealing with terminal agitation, that there's nothing that, I mean, it's just been almost impossible. And that's one of the hardest things to deal with when people are fighting it. They fight the process, they fight the death, they're climbing out of bed, they're striking out and nothing works and it's exhausting. And so at that point, the team can get together to consider some type of palliative medication. I'm not gonna say what that might be. It could be some type of um, uh, medication given uh, subcutaneous or uh, through some kind of an IV port that wouldn't be a huge overdose, not like the end of life option in California, which is you know completely different, but it would be something that would allow them to relax. It would be very well monitored, but it's not, it's not a homicide, certainly, and it's certainly not a suicide. I hope that explained it a little bit. Thank you. Um, I also just want to add, uh, I, I have several comments about the ambiguous nature of the second poll question. 
<laughs> so for everybody out there, I wanted to take the wrap for that because I, I developed the poll questions and um, I know that you guys are really sharp and you took exception to the use of the word available and provided. So I apologize and we'll move on to the next question. Uh, when my wife with Alzheimer's cries, does this mean that she's in pain? It could be. Uh, that is a possibility that she's in pain, not necessarily. So the registered nurse or the, the skilled nurse that's coming to visit your wife would do a really thorough assessment to determine if there's any other indicators that might show pain. It, it can be pain, it can be other things. It can be just some deep-seated emotion that we're just not aware of that she's feeling because of course she can't articulate it. So it's not necessarily pain, but it could be pain. And really, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to avoid the question, but things aren't always black and white. It's up to the team to use the correct tools to get a really good evaluation to determine if that is part of what some pain she might be feeling. And if it is, we would certainly recommend some kind of intervention to help with that. Thank you, Judy. Uh, the doctor won't approve hospice. Is there any other way to get hospice for loved one? If the doctor won't approve it, it really depends. Again, uh, it depends on the reason why the doctor won't approve it. I would never be one to second guess a doctor. They have the education. They have the training. Um, I, would, I don't know why the doctor's not approving hospice. If they're not approving it because it goes against their particular philosophy on wanting to continually try to cure the patient, then I might recommend, you know, just getting uh, other opinions or, or, you know, just having direct conversations with that. Sometimes it's hard for some people to uh, stand up and be, um, you know, to talk to the doctor and say, you know, this is really what we want. I understand that you want to cure my mom or my dad or whatever, but we have, as a family have made this decision and this is what we really want. So you could, I would try to directly speak to that particular doctor about that issue. If not, I would, I would recommend, is in anything else in healthcare, a second opinion. And then also, if it's because the patient is really not appropriate for hospice, um, that's a different issue because there is certain criteria that you have to meet in order to be appropriate for a hospice care. And if the person does not meet that criteria, unfortunately, uh, they will not be admitted to hospice. It's just, it's just one of, it's a, it's a regulation. Uh, we have to make sure that the, the money that is being spent by Medicare, Medi-Cal, and other insurance agencies is being spent reasonably and accurately. So we do have to make sure that we meet that criteria. Okay. I let's see. I, I we do. I do have a couple more questions, but I think what I want to do at this point, if, with your uh, permission, is just remind everyone of our next upcoming webinar, because it does entail a, a, a time change. So our next webinar is Tuesday, July 10th, and it does begin at 11.30 a.m. Uh, as a result of lots of feedback from our uh, attendees, we were out multiple times to move this to a more palliable uh, hour and so we have done that so again the next upcoming webinar is Tuesday July 10th at 11:30 a.m. and the um, topic is successful mealtime strategies for dementia caregivers and I will be your speaker okay let's go back to questions uh, will a progressive stage two bed sore qualify someone for hospice care? Um, not on its own, I can answer that. If that's the only issue that's going on, it will not qualify somebody for hospice care. Typically, the pressure ulcers or bed sores are, uh, that are going to uh, sort of impact a terminal diagnosis and impact someone's uh, continued eligibility for hospice are progressive stage three and four pressure ulcers, but that alone even, pressure ulcers would not make somebody eligible for hospice. It's something we will treat, and we will treat to the best of our ability, but uh, when someone is on hospice, but it will not make somebody eligible alone. 
Okay, thank you. And then the final question kind of goes back to that issue of terminal sedation. Um, and the uh, question is, will hospice take the lead in initiating an assisted death? Oh, okay, thank you. That's a really good question. Boy, that's another one now. Well, we've done a webinar on that one. We could do another whole webinar on that. Um, just the short answer that I can tell you, if you're talking about an assisted death, so that's outside of terminal sedation. I heard terminal sedation and I heard assisted death. Assisted death is following the guidelines of the law in California that say that a person that's terminal may choose to take medications based on specific legal criteria that will definitely end their life if they take this dose of medication. All hospices have their own policies and particular philosophies on how they deal with that particular law. Uh, the care choices, uh, we will educate uh, someone that wants to know about that but our doctors do not participate in that, in that we will not prescribe the end-of-life medications. Uh, we will support you, we will take care of the patient while they're on hospice, even if they choose to take that option, but we don't, um, we don't uh, order the medications, and uh, that would be something that the person would have to do outside of the hospice. I hope that answers that. As far as terminal sedation, we will guide you if it was a terminal sedation issue, as we spoke of earlier, with somebody that's having a terminal agitation, uh, our panel and our committee will discuss the different options with the patient, the family, and the caregivers. Okay, thank you both so much. Uh, we really, really appreciate both of you uh, for sharing your time and your considerable expertise on this important topic. And of course, we thank our attendees uh, for participating and asking such thought-provoking questions. So uh, again, I want to remind everyone that as they leave the webinar, you will get an evaluation pop up on your screen. You'll also get it via email, and that's got to be completed and returned so that you can get your CE credit for the day. Again, our next, uh, we're, we're uh, putting a new time play, a time slot into play next month with our series, and the topic is successful mealtime strategies for dementia caregivers, and that is on Tuesday, July 10th at 11.30 a.m. If you're interested in learning about other webinars and opportunities, professional opportunities and family classes, please visit our website at www.alzoc.org. And before we uh, end the day, I just, or end the uh, session, just sincere thanks once again to our wonderful partners um, at O'Connor Mortuary Alzheimer's Orange County and Care Choices uh, Hospice and Palliative Services. And again, our thanks to our speakers. Everyone have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.